All right, so our, our lesson today is lesson eight, uh, Managing for the Master, and the uh, title is Planning for Success. Planning for Success. And the lesson rightly asks the question, how do you define success? How do you define it? What determines whether you're successful or not? My granddaughter Lennox uh, played on the Santa Fe Gap STA basketball team this year. And they did not win one game. <laughs> Were they successful? Yes. Well, they all, they all improved their basketball skills. Whether they won or lost, they practiced more and their skills got better. Uh, because they practiced their eye-hand coordination, that helps actually develops the cerebellum, and developing the cerebellum helps develop uh, not just organized and fluid motor movements, it later helps develop organized and fluid thinking processes and decision-making, so they successfully help their brains develop in a healthy way. They experience the benefits of physical exercise. Uh, they learned teamwork. They experienced bonding and improved friendships. Uh, they also learned how to handle themselves in the face of defeat and to be good sports, what's called good sports, having positive attitudes, affirming others, being kind, uh, and focusing on something other than simply winning or losing at all costs. And because of that, they were, their team was selected by all the other teams for the Sportsmanship Award. So were they successful or did they fail? It depends on your goal. It depends on your criteria of how do you, and this is the question of our class today. Uh, I'm proud of Lennox, not primarily because of her improved basketball skills, which did improve. I'm proud because of her spirit, her attitude, her choice to be kind and, and supportive and encouraging, not just for her team members, but encouraging of the opponent's team members, that she was actually more focused on something other than winning and losing. And I'm proud of you for that, Lennox. So what is the standard that determines success in God's kingdom? Oh. Is it the Ten Commandments? No. <laughs> is it how well we keep a list of, of rules? No, for sure. What about motive of heart? Would it have any bearing? Regardless of the actual activity, could we do an activity with a bad motive, but the activity is a good activity? Yes. Like in-gathering in the old days. Remember, anybody remember in-gathering? Oh, yeah. Anybody remember Jasper Wayne? Uh, yes. To get your Jasper Wayne ribbon? The purple one. Yeah. Did anybody remember that? I'm showing my age now. Yeah. yeah. Living in harmony with God's designs. What does that actually look like? Is living in harmony with God's designs, his laws, his protocols for life, is that measured primarily by how well we perform at tasks? No. Or is it primarily by the motive of the heart? So could a success, would a successful person be one who loves God and others, loves the truth, and has a heart to advance and grow in the truth, has a certain humble attitude that says, you know what, as much as I currently know, I know I'm finite, and therefore I'm open to have my ideas corrected and proved upon as more truth is made available to me, so I'm, I'm able to grow, and they look forward to growing. They're honest and kind and loyal and faithful, and they're trustworthy, and they have self control, the last fruit of the Spirit, self-governance, they're mature, they have wisdom into the principles and methods of God. Is this what success looks like? Good step in the right direction. Good step in the right direction, yeah. How does a person become like this? By joining the right organization? No. I think I heard somebody say it, by beholding we become changed. The law of worship. We actually assimilate neurobiologically, characterologically. We are changed by what we admire, esteem, watch, spend time thinking about, approve of. Do you know that you have a responsibility to approve of God? What's it say in Romans 12? 
Therefore, brothers, I urge you, in view of God's mercy, to present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. What? Aren't we just supposed to say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. We don't have any vote on approving of his will. Or do we? Why? Why do we have to approve his will? <coughs> Law of liberty. And what happens if you do something that is right, but you disagree with it? Are you are you improved by doing something that you resent and are angry about having to do, even if it's the right thing to do? Or you're only transformed and renewed when you approve and agree. This is why. It's not that God is waiting for your approval for him to figure it out. It is you can't be transformed. I can't be transformed unless we understand and approve his will. We agree. Yes, you're right. That's better. I agree. That's what I want too. That's the renewing of the mind. But what is the standard of success by the world? I've laid out the standard of success in God's kingdom. What is the standard that the world measures success by? Money. 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 Power. Power. Oh, those are my first two. Mm -hmm. Fame. Fame. There you go. Fame. Okay, that's a, that was on mine as well. Money. <laughs> position. What a position. Like a president, pope, CEO, uh, whatever. Whatever position that you're in. Clicks and followers, or views of your latest self-disclosure. <laughs> Gold medals, awards of various kinds. How about performance? How well you perform at a task? How about survival? Do we sometimes confuse the standards of the world with the standards of God? Consider, as I was preparing for class this week, I was reading in, in some historical documents, and, and I was reading a book called Christian Education. Not the book Education, the book Christian Education by E.G. White. And I came across this quote uh, about a Christian school in Battle Creek. That school today is called Andrews University. But listen, listen see, see if this has any relevance, if you agree with this. It says, our college at Battle Creek is a place where the young members of God's family are to be trained according to God's plan of growth and development. They should be impressed with the idea that they are created in the image of their maker and that Christ is the pattern which they are to follow. Is this the message our young people will get from the public school system? No. 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 Not hardly. Does it make a difference in development of our children if they believe they are made in the image of God and are to pattern themselves after Christ, or if they believe there is no God and we're the final evolutionary link in a chain of evolving animals where the strongest kill the weakest? Does it actually make a difference? It makes a huge difference. Now, continuing on with the quote. Our brethren... No, no, our brethren permit their minds to take too narrow and too low a range. They do not keep the divine plan ever in view, but are fixing their eyes upon worldly models. Notice who's doing this. Public school teachers are setting their... No. Our brethren. Our church members, leaders, educators... Do you think when she says they're setting their, mind, their, their, their minds to a too narrow range, do you think she's suggesting that our Christian school educators are teaching there is no God and to not read the Bible? No. No, it's not what she's talking about. <coughs> she's saying that our Bible-believing, God-fearing brethren have in some other way had a too narrow view and have fixed their standards on worldly models. It's her word, worldly models. Could that be the 
worldly model of law and justice. Teaching that God's law works like human law. Did any of you grow up in Christian education? I did. I went through Christian schools and we were clearly taught God has a law and it operates like human law. He keeps track. There's a record. There's a judicial process. There's an investigation. There's inflicted punishments. You better get payment made. Uh, Somebody's got to pay the price. If you don't, he's required by law to punish. Too narrow. And what happens in the heart and the mind if people internalize that view of God? Well, she goes on. Look up where Christ sits at the right hand of God and then labor that your pupils may be conformed to that perfect pattern. So the recommendation here? Take our eyes off the worldly standards. Make Christ the center Is there a law involved in that? By beholding, we become changed. That's the law of worship. Fix fix your eyes upon Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. It's the law of worship. We become like him. And and Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So we're not just to fix our eyes on Jesus and recognize how wonderful Jesus is. If we fix our eyes on Jesus and study his life, we will uncover that Jesus taught that when you're seeing him and recognizing him, you're actually seeing The the Father. And so our ideas of God are to change from this imperial dictator worldly view to recognize that God doesn't function like human dictators. His law doesn't function. Continuing with the quote, if you lower the standard in order to secure popularity and an increase of numbers and then make this increase a cause of rejoicing, you show great blindness. If numbers were evidence of success, Satan might claim the preeminence, for in this world, his followers are largely in the majority. Do we ever get tempted to measure our success by numbers? Absolutely, yeah. Have you ever, I'm sure that you've never heard anything about pastors being judged by how many baptisms <laughs> that they have in a particular time frame. No. That, that would not be something any church you would know about would do. Universities and their enrollment numbers. Universities and enrollment, yeah. Meeting certain diversity diversity standards to make sure that your enrollment stays up. Uh, We have a document coming out on that soon, folks. It'll blow your mind at at the corruption that's been happening. I won't say more about that today. What about the lowering to keep lowering the standards not just for Numbers, but how about to keep the government's approval of us and our funding and our Medicare reimbursements? So our health care institutions won't close. When is it okay to exchange the principles of God for the methods of this world? Have we seen over the last several years Christian organizations not only doing so, but then justifying their coercion of conscience as an act of love? Mm-hmm. And then finishing up this quote, it says, It is the degree of moral power pervading the college that is a test of its prosperity. It is the virtue, intelligence, and piety of the people composing our churches, not the numbers, that should be the source of joy and thanks- thankfulness. What are the things that we value that hold the standard of success for us? Is it the worldly measure, how much money, how many people... Or is it the quality of character and integrity of our people? You know the motto, the motto of Liberty University? You'll see it everywhere on billboards up there and on their websites and so forth. Training champions for Christ. Wow. That's the motto of their school. Training champions for Christ. And in every leadership meeting that I've attended thus far, they make... That mission central to all of their meetings. All of the, well, we have to talk about administrative this and how we're going to do that. It's always linked back to how will this help us train champions for Christ. Wow. That's the focus. How will this help us train, 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 train champions for Christ? As I was thinking about this and preparing the lesson, I came across another <coughs> quote. And this one is from youth instructor, February 7, 1901, 120 years ago. It says, it should be, uh, and and my view is that if I were to present this to the faculty there, 
they would all embrace this and support this, I, the, these things taught. Let, let's unpack them. It should be fi the fixed purpose of the youth to aim high in all their plans for their life work. They should adopt for their government in all things the standard which God's word presents. Mm -hmm. What government? <laughs> their government. They should adopt for their government. In other words, how they govern themselves. Their self-government is what this is talking about. And what they should adopt for their government are the standards of God's word. What is the standard of God's word that they should adopt? Is it a list of rules? Should we, should we go to the Bible to find a list of approved foods and prohibited foods and then make that a rule book and not only apply it to ourselves but also judge others in our community uh, who claim to be Bible-believing by our list? And if we see people not eating the foods that are, that are on the prohibited list, they're eating off stuff off the naughty list, then we can have confidence to know that they're not really Bible followers. They don't really believe the Bible because they don't eat the foods that the Bible says are okay to eat. Is, is, is that what the author means about using the, the God's word as a standard for self-government? Yeah. We're going to unpack that some more. The next sentence in this uh, quote says, this is the Christian's positive duty and it should be also his positive pleasure. Let your mind just hit that thought. Just, just think about that for a moment. Do you hear any contradiction there? Duty. I'm going to put a duty on you, and you better enjoy it. It better be pleasurable to you, because it, 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 it's your duty, and you gotta gotta like it. See, can parents, because of the principles of good health, have certain duty for their children to eat certain foods, maybe turnip greens, <laughs> <laughs> to be in harmony with the laws of health and, and, and can a parent bring some pressure to bear where the, the child is uh, under, under pressure fulfilling their duty and they eat their turnip greens to fulfill their obligations or their duty to be healthy C could that happen uh, can you make them enjoy it no. make it be a pleasure <laughs> no the Bible, though, has filled with all types of Sabbath duties, isn't it? Filled with the Sabbath and all types of duties that we have to do or not to do on the Sabbath. Don't you find lots of text and references along those lines? Yet Isaiah tells you, if you don't delight in doing it, you're not keeping the Sabbath. If you eat your greens, but you don't enjoy them, you're not really obedient. <laughs> Is that confusing to anybody at all? Which law lens yes. you're looking through? Yes. <laughs> yes. Back in the high school days, there's got to be a standard. And even now, there's got to be a standard. So if you've got a kid in there, you want everyone to be welcome. So you're trying to teach them and guide them and have them desire these principles. But there's also got to be a standard because you can't have kids in there disrupting everything and not following the rules and bringing other students down. So how do you draw the line? And then what do you do? I mean, there's kids that are going to get expelled for their behavior, but do, then we don't reach out to try do, to get do, them back. Do parents who love their children set rules with even potentially coercive enforcement for say, teeth brushing or not playing in the street? Yeah. Do parents do that for their children? Right. To a certain age. Does there come a time for the vast majority of people that they begin doing this without parental oversight? They, they have left home and they continue to brush it and they actually don't play in traffic. <laughs> How is it possible that they would do these things without parental coercive force? It's maturity. You, you so back to, so you apply that in reverse to our religious rules or obligations or duties. Have we connected to our children reasons for brushing teeth and not playing in traffic? 
and we connected reasons, that as they mature, they're able to comprehend and realize, and then teeth brushing as a small child, I can remember, it was a duty without pleasure. <laughs> I had to do it, and I wanted to be playing. It was interfering with what was fun. I brush my teeth regularly, and I take pleasure into it. Happy to do it, because I want to keep my teeth clean. I want to keep them healthy. I'm, I'm, my grandmother had false teeth. I really like having my own teeth. <laughs> I take pleasure in that, don't you? Yes. Okay? And so something changed in my understanding of the duty, and that was design law, how reality works. I'm perfectly free not to brush, floss, and take care of my teeth, but I'm not free to have healthy teeth if I don't care for them. They will decay. <coughs> God does not take our freedom. And so the problem that many people have had in the church with our children is we often teach them a potential rule or duty that is based on some higher principle design law, but we fail to connect it. And it's only out of obligation, out of rule. God said it. The Bible said it. Sister White said it. I said it. The teacher said it. The school has a rule. The church has said it. Okay, I'm glad they said it, but, but why? Well, because it's sin if you don't. And, and you don't want to sin. If you sin, you have to be punished. And they go down this very childlike explanation. And if the only reason your child ever learned to brush teeth was because mommy has a rule, and if they don't, they get punished. And there's no other reason ever in their mind for it. When they move out, what do they do? Stop they stop brushing. And this is why many people leave the church. They're told things that make no sense. They're never given real-world explanations to the value. They don't understand design laws. And so the big principles we teach in this class, of course, are God's laws or design laws. You cannot have health while violating the laws of health. You can't have mental health if you're <coughs> violating the laws of mental health. And there are laws that govern the operations of the mind. You can't have relational health while you're cheating on your spouse. You can't. It doesn't matter if you cheat and then fall on your knees and ask forgiveness. You, you, can't have, you can't have relational health until you have loyalty and trust. I mean, this is how reality works. The good news, if you have not been brushing and flossing and you've got cavities and you go to a dentist and he fills the cavities and teaches you, you can start brushing and flossing and you can get healthy. Because you can't avoid the health benefits. Even if you were unhealthy, you can't avoid the benefits and the healing that comes from choosing to harmonize with God's laws. Can't avoid the harm for breaking. You can't avoid the benefits from harmony. That's how reality works. Continue with the quote, cultivate respect for yourself because you are Christ's purchased possession. What's the big idea being taught here? Why should a person have self-respect? According to this, what's the reason? They have value. Yeah, they have value, that's right. But why is the reason in this sentence that they have value? We belong to Christ. We belong to Christ. Okay, that's true. That's the fact. So what kind of value is that? Value in what? I'm making a point. It's a big point. It's contrary to the world. What is the world value? In other words, your value comes for who, from who you are, not from what you do. Amen. You are a child of God. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Our value is in who we are as image bearers of our creator, but the world doesn't value who we are. The world values how well you perform what you do, how much money you earn, how well you can sing, how well you can act, how well you can, how fast you can run, how high you can jump, how many balls you can shoot through a hoop. And we value it highly because we will pay people who can hit home runs and shoot balls through hoops tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. <coughs> because we really value that. I know. <laughs> but a person who will be a chaplain and visit somebody in the hospital we're lucky to employ them. Continuing with the quote, success 
in the for, in the formation of right habits, advance advancement in that which is noble and just will give you an influence that all will appreciate and value. What determines what is noble and just? What is noble and just? Do you hear a lot about justice and just and doing what's just and just and justice in the world today? Is God's standard of justice and the world's standard of justice the same? No. God's standard of justice is love. Can't argue with that. One way to say it. There's another way to say the same thing. There's multiple synonyms for God's standard of justice. Love. You could say God because God is love. love. Okay, so God is his own standard. God's character and God's character is expressed in his law. Law is a transcript of his character. Uh, and what kind of law? All, which is primarily expressions of love and liberty and truth and the protocols of how reality works. This is God's standard of justice, doing what is actually right, healthy, and reasonable, because it actually works that way and is right, healthy, and reasonable. That's the just and right thing to do. You know, in the Greek, dikaio, dikaiosune, is the word translated just, justice, right, righteousness. Same single word, because if you do the right thing, you're doing the just thing. So, so again, what's right Healthy, reasonable, because it is so. That's always just. It's always the right. And how do you develop habits of any kind? Mm -hmm. Repetition. Mm -hmm. By choosing to do them repeatedly, and your brain rewires, you make neural pathways, and as you make those neural pathways, mm -hmm. whether they're motor pathways, like a certain golf swing, or, or practicing a, a certain musical instrument in your fingering, and pretty soon it becomes so easy you don't even have to think about it, or everybody in this room... Uh, those who still brush their teeth have a habit on how you brush your teeth. You start in the same, use the same hand with the brush, start in the same place in the mouth, go through in the same way every time. You don't have to think about it. It's a habit. And you are free and intelligent beings. You might have read an, an article that said, if, you know, if you actually use your offhand to do things, you create new neural circuits and it has a, a, a dementia protecting effect and your brain stays healthier. And there's actually science to prove, to suggest that's true. And so you think, wow, that's good. I'm going to choose to start brushing my, my teeth with my other hand starting tonight. And if you make that decision in class right now, what's likely to happen when you go to brush your teeth tonight? <laughs> you will brush it the way you've always done it with the dominant hand. And then you'll go to bed and you'll be laying there and about 15 minutes later you're going to go, oh, I was supposed to start with the other hand. And at that point you go, I'm dumb, I'm stupid, I can't learn, I can't change. Yeah, I'm, I'm pointing out to you because this is what happens with my patients in counseling. We will have certain patterns of habits of how they process, how they choose, how they relate, how they react. And, and I will, we will talk about how this is a healthier way and they will have an, an enlightenment. They will see, oh, I get that. I agree. Yes, I'm going to start doing that. And then the next day they're out and something happens and they do the exact same old thing they've always done. And then sometime afterwards they go, oh, I was supposed to do it the other way. I'm stupid. I'm dumb. I guess I can't learn. And this is what they do and they quit. No, it's a habit. They did it because they weren't focused at the time. And it, just like brushing your teeth, if you want to change the habit, even though you've already brushed them, you've been in bed for 10 minutes, you get up and you go brush them a second time in the new way. <laughs> and you might do that two or three nights in a row. And then what will happen is you'll be there halfway through your mouth and then you remember, oh no, and you'll stop and you'll be so happy you didn't get in bed first. <laughs> and then you'll start with the new way. And, and this is how habits change. And the more you do the new one, eventually the old one, and you stop doing the old one, the brain prunes back that old circuit and you establish a new one. These are habits change. So the author said, success in the formation of right habits, advance, advancement in, in that which is noble and just will give you uh, an influence that others will appreciate and value. And then it goes on to say, here's the next thing that the, this author says. Live for something besides self. Live for something besides self. Is this a rule? It's a principle. It's a did, you know, did you notice 
She didn't say, live for someone besides self. Did you hear someone live for some other person? She didn't say that. Live for something besides self. I have many people who live for someone besides self. They're codependent, empty shells, constantly seeking to please other people. Sacrificing everything to make that other person happy. That's dysfunctional. Live for something is calling to a higher purpose. It's calling to move past doing just what makes me feel good and helps me advance to uplifting a cause that you value more than self. And ultimately that cause, of course, is God and his kingdom and the saving of souls. But I asked this question earlier, I asked it again, but what happens if we use force to make a person do something that is beneficial to others that the person does not agree with? What happens to the one who's forced? It actually hardens their heart, incites rebellion. This is why God does not run his government this way. God does not say, love me, or I'll be required by law and justice to use my power to torture and kill you. Which is almost what the entire Christian world teaches God is saying. That model, that idea violates the law of liberty. It incites, it incites rebellion. You either get mindless followers who don't ask questions because they don't want to get in trouble and they become uh, kind of dogmatic religious rule keepers, or you get rebels. And both fit Satan's goal. I want to move on. Well, no, I'm going to finish that quote. It says, if, you're, if your motives are pure and unselfish, if you're ever looking for, uh, for work to do, if you're always on the alert to show kindly attention and do courteous deeds, you are unconsciously building your own monument. That's what the quote says. Unconsciously building your own monument. What do you think that means? If you do all the good things, you live courteously, you're kind, you're loving, you're other-centered... You're building your... What, what, what kind of monument is being talked about here? Character. Character. You're building mature character. You're becoming like Christ. You're building a reputation of trustworthiness, of beauty, of person, of reliability. A person who will stand firm in the face of the winds of opposition. Somebody who can be depended upon. A monument that won't be moved to virtue and righteousness. It may not be seen by the worldly selfish people, but it will be seen by God and the heavenly beings that are watching. And does that type of firmness of character sound like somebody who would be successful? Well, what if some people take the position of the Bible standards for our success does mean that we are to use it as a code book? to find the right rules and the right rituals to keep, the right or wrong foods or the clothes or how to dress or, or how to, how to uh, worship, the rituals that we're to attend. And they make a list of this. And not only do they make a list for themselves, once they've made their list, it becomes their mission to convert everybody else to keeping their list too. <laughs> Have you ever met people like this? <laughs> yeah, I think we've all met people like this. And, and, and I want to assume that these people actually want to be good. I'm going to assume that they're not actually intending to be harmful. But the impact of people like this, if you watch the impact on the community, does it actually have a good impact or does it harm? Does it cause division? Does it hurt? Is it disruptive? Well, as I was thinking about these questions, in light of the health message given to the Adventist Church and, and what, a, what, a, what a blessing the health message has been, and understand that the health message is a message about the laws of health. It's about understanding that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and that we should learn how it operates and functions and we should make intelligent, wise choices to live in harmony with what's healthiest for our being so we can be of greatest usefulness in God's cause possible because sickness and disease disables us and diminishes our ability to carry out God's purposes. And so the health message is all about living in harmony with the principles of God's kingdom, the laws of health. 
Well, but as I was thinking about all this, I came across this quotation. Tell me what you think about this quotation. This is out of Testimonies of the Church. Uh, looks like it's volume 2, page 374. While we would caution you not to overeat, even of the best quality foods, we would also caution those who are extremists not to raise a false standard and then endeavor to bring everybody to it. There are some who are starting out as health reformers who are not fit to engage in any other enterprise and who have not, not sense enough to carry out their own families or uh, yeah, to take care of their own families or keep their proper place in the church. What do they do? Why they fall back on the health reform as health reform physicians, as though they could make that a success. They assume the responsibilities of their practice and take the lives of men and women into their hands when they really know nothing about the business. Mm. Wow. Do you like people who speak plain truth? <laughs> 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 Tell it like it is. No sugarcoating. No... Amen. Okay. Do you understand this, this author is applying the principles of Romans 14? Let every person be fully persuaded in their own mind. Some think this food, some think that day. Uh, every person be fully persuaded in their own mind. Don't try to bring everybody else to your standard. <clears throat> but notice in this context, it wasn't just about that. If you read the description of the people who do this, these are people she described as having responsibilities that they are not fulfilling of their own. She says, they have not sense enough to care for their own families and keep their proper place in the church. In other words, they have responsibilities of theirs. They're not fulfilling them. They're not doing it. And what is the natural result of not fulfilling one's legitimate duties when one has the capable, capability of doing so? What's the natural result? You're able to, but you're being negligent. You're not doing it. What's the natural result of doing that in the person? Guilt, shame, and feelings of inadequacy. That's the natural result. So these people are not fulfilling their duties. They're experiencing guilt, shame, and inadequacy. And if they ref refuse to respond to the godly conviction of the Holy Spirit, which is seeking to lead them to humble repentance to Jesus Christ for enlightenment of what their duties are, and, and if they don't choose to go that way, and they don't choose to begin fulfilling their responsibilities, which would relieve their guilt, shame, and inadequacy, and cause them to be successful, if, if they choose not to do that, and resist instead, then the guilt, shame, and inadequacy only worsens. Having rejected the path of truth and repentance, then they still seek, because nobody likes. You ever had guilt? You ever had shame? You ever had feelings of inadequacy? You like those feelings? Nobody likes them. They want them to make them go away. And if you don't repent and fulfill your duties and, 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 and uh, follow God's cause, then there's only another way to make them go away, and that is denial. So they repress, they avoid, and then they will often pursue some behavior that they can attach virtue and righteousness to. <laughs> that they can claim by fulfilling this behavior, now they're fulfilling God's purpose for their life, and they become an extremist. Wow. In some behavioral element of life, like how they dress or how they eat. Their fastidious compliance with their righteous food list makes them feel good and allows them to avoid their suppressed guilt, shame, and inadequacy for, ne for neglecting their true duties. Having taken this position as a means of avoiding their own guilt, shame, and inadequacy, they cannot tolerate any feedback that would suggest their righteous eating is not the source of righteousness. Such as other people in their, their circle, their community being recognized as virtuous righteousness while they don't conform to their eating pattern. If you can be righteous and eat those foods, then maybe my eating isn't really how I'm becoming righteous. I can't tolerate that. And so they become petty, they become critical, they become argumentative, they will often seek to get people removed from their position in the church because they saw you eating a food you shouldn't eat or drinking something you shouldn't drink. It's not on the approved list. But not wearing a mask. Not wearing a mask. <laughs> yeah, same thing. Yeah, same dynamic. Oh, there's a lot of truth in that. And so they have to promote their righteous list upon others in the community 
because it's integral to their way of coping with their own guilt and shame. Thus they criticize, fault, find, and so forth. Such an extremist almost always views their life as a success. In fact, they're one of the few successful. They're one of the few who's able to live such a virtuous life of self-restricted eating habits or whatever the, the issue might be. Have you seen people like this? It's very sad. Uh, Sunday's lesson, first paragraph, says, as youth matures into adulthood, thoughts will arise about having to provide for basic needs, food, clothing, shelter. Jesus himself has told us how to prioritize our needs, and he said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Of course, for those who are older and who didn't make the choice for Jesus when they were young, there is still time to make the right decisions regarding stewardship. Interesting how they kind of drop that in there. (laughs) What do you think about Jesus' promise? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Does that mean if you don't have adequate food, shelter, clothing, that means you're not seeking the kingdom of God? Does it mean if you don't have adequate food, shelter, and clothing that all you need to do is have more Bible studies and prayer time and you will have those provided for you. No. But he said, if don't seek these things, seek first again God and, and you won't have, it'll all be added to you. Are you disagreeing with Jesus here? Is Jesus setting up a quid pro quo system of receiving blessings by serving him? The health wellness gospel. The more health and the more wealth is evidence that you're being blessed by God because you're seeking his kingdom. And if you're not wealthy and healthy, it's because somewhere in your life you must have sin you haven't confessed and you're not actually seeking God. You're not seeking his kingdom, folks. Sounds like the old Jewish tradition. Well, this is exactly how the uh, disciples thought in Christ's day. So the rich young, young ruler we spoke about a couple of weeks ago, there's a huge sex, section of, of Christians who think this way. Huge. The health, wellness, gospel. Is this biblical truth? No. That you can determine your, your virtue with God by, the, by your health and, and wealth. Well, I think that prosperity ministry, even the last two lines of our Sabbath school lesson alluded to the prosperity. You mean about the, the stewardship? Yeah. Yeah, because uh, we had a whole lesson about paying your tithe and you're going to get a windows of heaven will open up to pour out a blessing. <laughs> but the blessing really isn't primarily monetary. The blessing is character development and Christ likeness and peace and removal of guilt and shame, and growing up to build that character monument that can stand firm in the face of difficulties. Tim, rightly understood, seeking the kingdom of God is seeking how all of his laws function, how reality functions, how design functions, uh, how how life was created to operate functions, Mm -hmm. and, and... Engaging in meaningful work is is one of the laws, the law of exertion, and it's one of the things that uh, required for development. Is required for, for for development. It's also seeking the kingdom of God, and one of the byproducts of that is uh, a steady income, where you can provide food and clothing for yourself and loved ones. I mean, it's, it's mm-hmm. <coughs> So if we think about what Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you, only in a temporal way, and, and there are temporal yeah. co- consequences, but only in a temporal way, I think we're m- really missing what Jesus is trying to say. Right. I think his real message, uh, even though it's absolutely true, what Russell said about the, the laws of exertion and sowing and reaping and all of these laws, I think Jesus is really trying to say, prioritize eternal life over temporal life. What, is it, what does it matter if you gain all the wealth of the earth and lose your eternal soul? What does it matter? I think this is what he is actually trying to say. Prioritizing eternal over temporal, it doesn't mean God doesn't care about our temporal needs. He does. Jesus spent a lot of time on earth healing people, feeding people, caring for people, and, and we are called to do the same. So there is absolutely a place for temporal relief. But what difference does it make if we lift every single human being out of poverty and give them more food than they can ever eat if they're all lost eternally? 
So there's a place for it, but it has to be under the umbrella of really seeking the truth. So we must be so settled into the truth of God's kingdom and loyalty to him that we would not bow to an idol to avoid a furnace or stop praying to avoid a lion's den or stop preaching the gospel in order to avoid being imprisoned like the the apostles were or we would not embezzle to pay our house payment or steal to get money to go to school or bear false witness to get a promotion. We wouldn't do this. We would rather lose the job or not get admitted than to compromise our integrity and our character. I think that's what he's saying. The kingdom of God has to be prioritized over the advancements and things of this world. Yes or no? Yes. It would be better to be like so many martyrs who sleep in death awaiting the resurrection into eternal life than to live a few more earthly years and then still sleep in death and lose eternal life. God's priority for everyone, his primary purpose for every single human being is eternal life. And from God's perspective, since Adam's sin, with the exception of Elijah and Enoch, every person has died young. Imagine a rope 93 million miles long from our sun to our earth. 93 million mile rope. It's, I mean, that's still a finite rope, but it's still really too big for us to fully appreciate. But get your mind uh, as best you can. 93 million mile rope. And every inch on that rope, every inch on a 93 million mile rope represents one year of human life. On a 93 million mile rope is 969 inches, Methuselah, significantly better than 10 inches a child who dies at 10. Or, or it... it fr- on a 93 mile, million mile rope, you can't tell the difference. It's insignificant. And that's, a 90, that's a finite, infinite rope for all eternity. From God's perspective, everyone dies young. His primary concern is not primarily we live the Adventist health lifestyle and therefore live an extra seven years on earth. <laughs> Now, there is a benefit. He, the health, he wants us to live the health lifestyle so we're more useful for him on earth. We can carry out more. We have, we're able to go serve and minister and share more rather than being sick and have to be cared for by others. So there's a place for it. But it's not primarily just to have seven more years of life in a sinful world and die eternally. Last paragraph, it says, After Jacob made his spiritual and financial commitments to God, the Lord directed him to Rachel at the well. It is fitting to make your spiritual decisions and your life work decisions before committing to marriage. Your future spouse should know what they are getting into. (laughs) Is this person a committed Christian? What type of work will he or she be involved in? Will this person be a teacher, a nurse, a lawyer, a laborer, or whatever? What kind of life will I be committing to? Other questions that need answers before the marriage come in are what level of education has been completed? What amount of debt will come into the marriage? Am I willing to accept the situation as part of the responsibility? Uh, I think this paragraph actually points our, our minds in a very healthy direction. Did anyone give you advice before you chose your spouse? Anybody want to share what advice was given? (laughs) Marry rich! (laughs) I remember a Bible teacher telling us to trust God with the selection of our spouse. Now, I can't disagree with that. I think that's absolutely correct. I can tell you, though, at the time, I disagreed with that. But how? I disagreed with it because... The view of God I held was he was a rule maker, an arbitrary person. He wasn't somebody that was really trustworthy. He might actually have me marry somebody who I didn't find attractive, but who had good character. 
Th this was classic. I can't tell you how many pastors say, oh, you're just looking at the surface. You need to look at the character. So I was convinced, if I trust God, that he would have me pick somebody who was ugly but had good character. <laughs> Pardon? You can't have it all. You can't have it all. I can tell you the God that I know today is not true. That was absolutely false. But no one told me that. God absolutely wants everyone to have a spouse that they are thrilled with and they are so attracted to on every level. Yes. That's what he wants. I think it's actually better for people to know God for themselves as a friend before they get married. Yeah. If we don't know God, if we aren't friends with Jesus, then we're probably not ready to get married. What do you think? True. So what advice have you given to your children or grandchildren regarding finding out their spouse? Uh, have you given any advice to anybody? <laughs> Don't be unequally yoked. We're going to come to that Bible text in a moment. <laughs> any advice you would give today that is different than advice you gave in the past? <clears throat> what advice? Right, here's the question that you can all prepare to answer publicly. <laughs> What advice do you wish someone would have given you before you chose your spouse? <laughs> no, but maybe you shouldn't say anything. But, the, but, but is there advice you wish somebody would have given you before you chose your spouse? The lesson in the green section points us to 2 Corinthians 6.14 about not being unequally yoked. Is it enough for a potential spouse to believe in Jesus and to have been genuinely converted to Christ for them to be qualified to fit that text? No. Or is something more required than a real conversion experience in order for someone to be fit to marry, to be equally yoked? Would level of Christian maturity matter? Yes. Can a person genuinely be converted to Christ but still be immature in the things of God? Yes. yes perhaps approach their Christianity from a rule-keeping perspective, very much like a small child who wants to be a good little boy or a good little girl. They want to know the rules, and they want to keep the rules, and they, and they don't have any interest in, in, in why the rules are there. They just need to know what they are so they can be obedient and be good because they want to get a gold star, and they don't want to have any sin registered in their book, and they certainly don't want to be punished. They want to be good little boys and girls. Now, is that attitude of wanting to be good and want to obey the rules and not, and not causing problems? Is that attitude a, an attitude that is in rebellion? No. no. Not at all. It's not sinful. It's not evil to have that attitude. Shows the heart is aligned with the parents. This is a converted, immature Christian who wants to obey the rules, wants to please God, not in rebellion. So they would meet the qualifications of a being a believer. They're a believer. But would such a person make a good spouse? Not likely. Not until they mature. Perhaps two people at the same level of immaturity and good heart motive to grow in Christ could marry at that level and grow up together, perhaps, in their spiritual journey. But what happens to children who are eager to obey as children as they grow up if they never discover the reasons for the rules? They rebel. They rebel. What happens to Christians as newborn babes in Christ who are eager to know and obey the rules if they never actually grow up and understand the reasons behind them? Same thing. They leave the church. Uh, they rebel and leave or they become controlling critics. So what if you are a mature Christian in your walk, above the level of the child that Hebrews 5 talks about, that though you should be on meat, you're still on milk, and those on milk are not acquainted with the teachings of righteousness. So these are Christians, but they're not mature Christians yet. Um, 
but the mature have trained by pra- themselves by practice to be able to discern right from wrong. So you're a mature Christian. You marry somebody who is also a Christian, loves Jesus, but they're not mature yet. They're still in baby food. Do you think there might be problems in that relationship? Mm-hmm. Could an immature Christian who wants to please God but has not, not yet fully grown up to understand the principles, and so they're still rule-keeping... Could they, with motive of love, see their spouse do a behavior that breaks the rules? And they're convinced their spouse is sinning. And out of love, they want to counsel and redirect the spouse. But the spouse who did it recognizes in their conviction, and their understanding, their maturity, that this behavior wasn't sin at all. Could the one who's immature out of love seek to pressure the spouse to conform or change their behavior. Not, not out of any main reason other than, I don't want your soul to be lost. I don't want the sin to be registered in your book in heaven. And what happens in that relationship? Is there a law being violated here? Mm-hmm. What law is being violated? The law of liberty is being violated. Love cannot exist in an atmosphere without freedom. And an immature Christian seeking to enforce rules on their spouse breaks one of God's design laws, and love will be damaged, desire to rebel will be instilled in the heart, and if the spouse who is more mature actually submits to that type of control, they lose their individuality over time, and they become an empty, mindless, shadow person. All from a motive to love, without understanding what mature love looks like and how it functions. Any questions about that? Other elements that are important in finding a spouse? So you want someone that, is it enough for them to belong to the same denomination? No. This this spiritual maturity level is is critical. Critical. Having somebody who not only has given their heart to Jesus Christ, but has grown up into the things of God and has moved out of the childlike relationship into a mature relationship, and they understand the principles of God and can apply them in intelligent ways. They have to actually have love for God and love for others. There are other things, though, that have been shown in studies that make marriages compatible. That's a compatible, not identical, but compatible IQ. Having a spouse that can comprehend and understand the concepts and things that you understand, and you can talk together about those things, is stimulating and intriguing and gives texture and, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, intrigue and excitement, and, the, and you can build. And, but to have somebody who's substantially different where you can't really share in the discoveries and the ideas and the discussions, that can cause a rift to develop. So having compatible IQ has been shown one of the things to help marriages. Um, and then... General principles of life. So I would tell you when it comes to the maturity level of, of Christian we talked about, but then the, the same understanding of some of the practices of Christianity. How are you going to live your life? For instance, I, I can see two very mature, other-centered, wise Christian people, one who practices their community faith on going to church on Sunday, and one who practices going to church on Sabbath. And both of them in a safe relationship, both of them mature, marrying could cause some potential tension in that home. They may not be a good fit as marriage partners because of that. So having a s- similar expectations on how they want the home to function under the principles of God that they believe are valuable for them would be um, important for compatibility within the home. Does that make sense? All right, we're a little over now. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the way you run your kingdom. We thank you that you are the creator God who is love, whose laws are the protocols that life and health are built upon. We thank you for all that you've done to reach us through time, down through the, 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 
Bible writers through time, through Jesus Christ and all that he has done, and the continued revelations and the outpouring of your spirit, we ask that you will help us grow closer to you, understand and live out your methods, and to be able to bring others to this truth, to free them from, from all the confusion of this world that is so predominant in this, in this day and age. And, and that as we do this, that the world will be lighted, and you will come soon. We pray in your So, first announcement this morning, uh, in response to some of the requests from our listeners, we have developed some billboard. Uh, Dean, do you have those? Put it in there. Okay. okay. Yes. So, we have uh, these billboards that we've developed, and uh, in response to uh, requests from some of our listeners, and we're going to drop sets of these out at probably every quarter or so, and if you'll notice, there's different layouts, and there'll also be different images. Uh, which uh, have the same um, motto in each one. This one is discover the God that you can trust. So the discover the God that you can trust. And some of our friends around the circle have asked, hey, do you have some billboards? We'd like to put a billboard up in our community. Do you have something like that? And so we've developed these, and we're going to put them on our website. Dean said they'll be re ready for download tomorrow. So people can download them and use them in their community if they would like. Uh, there's no plan for common reason at this point to be purchasing billboard space. We're just developing these for individuals who've asked us to have something that they could put up in their community. So that's our plan. And, and I think we'll be dropping a set of four of these at probably every quarter or so. Uh, and the, the file of these will just build on our website and people can go and pick the one they want and use it if they'd like.